Hey, welcome back to part two of our seminar, Pandemic Recovery, where we're overcoming anxiety, trauma, and grief. Uh, my name is uh, Pastor Brian. I'm from Cross Point Church uh, in Anaheim, as well as we have a location in Ventura. And uh, man, I'm so excited about this next session. Uh, just to introduce you again to our guides uh, who are taking us on this growth journey this summer. So I want to welcome back uh, Dr. Earl Hensland, uh, a clinical psychologist, licensed marriage family therapist, uh, author of seven books, as well as uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, uh, America's most popular psychiatrist. Uh, he is a brain expert. He has scanned more brains than anyone on the planet. Uh, New York Times bestselling author, just released a, a brand new book uh, that I encourage you to get called The End of Mental Illness. And uh, also, we're so blessed to have uh, his wife, Tana. And uh, Tana's a nurse. She's also a New York Times bestselling author, health and fitness expert, uh, cancer survivor, and just an incredible speaker with a great heart. So we're so glad to have all of you guys back as we jump into part two, strategies to overcoming anxiety. Now, in our last episode, Dr. Raymond, you introduced us to the ants. Will you talk to us again about the ants and let's dig deeper into, into killing those ants as well. So whenever you have a thought, your brain releases chemicals. Every single time you have a thought, um, when you become aware of it, an electrical transmission goes across, your brain sends signals to every part of your body. So actually every thought affects all of your body. And uh, I did studies early in my career and found that whenever you had an angry thought, a hopeless thought, a helpless thought, a fear-based thought, your brain releases chemicals that make you feel bad. And it happens immediately. Your hands get colder. You start to sweat. Your muscles become tense, your heart begins to beat in an unhealthy way, and your breathing becomes faster and more shallow, so less efficient. But the opposite is also true. Whenever you have a happy thought, a hopeful thought, a loving thought, a peaceful thought, your brain releases a completely different set of chemicals that cause your hands to become warmer, drier, your muscles become more relaxed, your breathing becomes deeper and slower, your heart beats in a healthy way, and you just feel better. So thoughts are real, and they have a real impact on all of your physiology. But one of the things I learned is, and, and it's funny, I didn't learn this till I became a psychiatrist. I should have learned this in second grade. The thoughts lie. Um, they lie a lot. Now, they're also automatic. They just happen. They're based on complex chemical reactions and experiences from the past and the news. So um, they're automatic and they lie. And so I call them ants, automatic negative thoughts. And they're really like when you become anxious or depressed, you end up with an infestation that damages your mind and subsequently your brain and your body. If I could just add one thing to that. So I, I 100% everything my husband's saying, I think is spot on, obviously the expert with this but one thing that i became fascinated with as a nurse um what i when i suffered from anxiety and depression and a lot of negative thoughts like i didn't want to be on the planet that's a pretty negative thought um there's there's nothing worth living for and i became fascinated it was during a time i had cancer and so my mission became to learn to become my own advocate but also to learn what influences those thoughts and it was it's shocking how much our diet and exercise, our lifestyle can actually have an impact because if you're eating foods, um, certain foods, they affect your gut. 
if your gut's not healthy, it actually can cause anxiety and depression. So it's, it's not, yes, our thinking is so important for us to control, but it's, it's even more important, um, or not more important, equally important that we understand some of the things that actually influence our thinking. So in those four circles right. that the ants are always made worse if you didn't sleep. If you ate bad food that increases inflammation in your body right. or damages the gut bugs, since we're talking about bugs, uh, in the social circle, that if you're fighting with your spouse, the ants go up. And in a spiritual circle, if you're not holding on to your faith, then the ants are more likely to do battle with you and attack you. But learning how to kill the ants is a skill I think we should teach every child. We're going to work on that today. And it's not hard, but requires mental discipline just like, and you can't do it once. I mean, I can't have a salad for lunch uh, tomorrow and expect I'm going to lose 50 pounds. I need to develop a discipline around eating in order to be physically and mentally healthy. I need to develop a discipline around my thoughts so that I do it on a regular basis. As Earl talked about last time, getting 12,000 steps a day and it's helping him lose weight. We need to have that same um, mindset for dealing and killing the ants. Yeah, if I can press into that for a moment, because I think one of my questions is like consistency, because I, I, I find sometimes, uh, man, I, I want to do those things, but I'm like a roller coaster. I go up and I go down and yo-yo back and forth. And and one time I was telling my wife, it's like, I want to be consistent uh, in, in eating right. I want to be consistent doing these things. And, and then I said, well, I am consistent. I'm consistently inconsistent. <laughs> what would you say to that? of consistency of building those new disciplines? We actually have a course um, where we actually walk people through six months of helping them to build those habits. And for some people like me, they just want to jump the canyon and do it all at once. But there are other people, most people, um, they need to cross the canyon by walking down and going across the other side because they need tiny steps. And that's okay. It doesn't matter as long as you get to the other side of the canyon right? So as long as you develop those habits. And so we actually um, have strategies to walk people through to develop these habits because it takes time. It takes time and focus and discipline, just like it takes time and focus and discipline to get your body in shape or to get a black belt. It takes time. Well, and the first thing, and I don't know, Brian, if you and I did this, but it's the one page miracle. Mm -hmm. It always starts like in a Mindset. business or a church, it starts with plan. Mm -hmm. It's like, so what's the goal? What do you want? And so you have to write down, what do I want in my relationships, in my work, in my money, my physical, emotional, spiritual health? You ought to get that really clear. And then you ask yourself, so one of our tiny habits, does it fit? Does my behavior fit? If, does eating this get me what I want? So it's not that you shouldn't eat certain things. It's does it fit the goals you have for your life? And if you're not working toward your goals, that's a therapy issue. It's like, what is it about me that I don't like me, that I'm not working consistently toward my goals? But it always starts, whether you're dealing with an addiction or, or any problem, in, in my mind, it starts with let's define what you want and how your behavior is either getting you what you want or hurts what you want. If I could just add one last thing. Um, you actually have a strategy that works, that works for you with your spiritual life. The strategy works clearly, right? You can apply those same techniques that you use toward getting healthy. So you know some strategies that work. 
You just have to apply them in the same way. So some people try to like use strategies they've never seen before. They don't understand, like it's like this is all new when in fact you can use those same strategies. So I use the strategies to get my black belt that I used to get through nursing school, right? Or that I used in the trauma unit because you know that works. You can tap into that. That's really good. Dr. Henson, you're a clinical psychologist. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a few ants. Uh, talk to us about what you see are some of the most common ants that, that people struggle with. Yeah, I was just thinking that, Pastor, because uh, it might be kind of fun for all of us to talk about all just kinds of different ants. Like one of the one of my major ants would be fortune telling. You know, uh, I have to admit, God has not given me the gift of prophecy, but yet these thoughts will come up like somehow I know what's going to happen tomorrow <laughs> and in the future. And the thing about prophets, and Pastor, correct me if I'm wrong, the Scripture's got a certain guideline on prophets is they have to be 100% accurate. <laughs> so apparently I do not have that gift. So when I start looking to tomorrow, I'm in trouble because I don't have that gift. And if I start to look in the past and just get obsessed there, which just means that singlet, that anxiety part goes up and that singlet now is going over and over in the past. Well, that's not helpful either. And so... That's one of the big ants right there is, that we're facing today is uh, a fortune telling one. Another big ant that's out there today, uh, I think, is a judgment ant. You know, I mean, talk about insanity. <laughs> <laughs> judgment ants about everything, you know, in our culture today. You know, it, it, uh, and I'm trying really hard to, to stay correct in all this, so I, I will try to not go too far <laughs> with this. But the judgment ad, and that's not only about what's happening, but in our relationships, you know, uh, in the fourth step of the 12 steps and Alcoholics Anonymous did a fearless moral inventory of myself. And that's the big one right there. Looking at myself first helps turn around that judgment ad. As far as I know, there is only one perfect person on this universe, and that was Jesus Christ. Society couldn't handle that, and so they killed him, you know, and fortunately had the gift of being able to come back to life again. That's what we call resurrection. Uh, but when, so when it comes to judgment, none of us are in that spot of perfection <laughs> where we can make a judgment about an, another person. But maybe Dr. Amon and Tana can add in their, their favorite answers, but those are the ones that, that I'm seeing a lot of today, judgment and fortune-telling. Oh my lands. It's like there's not going to be enough hands cleanser around. Yeah. You know, there's not going to be enough toilet paper. And you know, and and the list list goes on. Other ants that are common, um all or nothing ants, things are all good or mm -hmm. all bad. Uh, mind reading where you arbitrarily believe you know what another person is thinking. Even though they haven't told you, I often tell Tana, please don't read my mind. I have enough trouble reading it myself. Um, guilt beating ants. Um, and we're in an epidemic of labeling ants. You know, you're liberal, you're conservative, you're, you know, this or that. And it's so harmful because whenever you label somebody, um, you lump them with all the people that were like that and call someone a jerk. And so you label them with all the jerks you've ever known. And then you can't deal with them individually. You're dealing with all of them at the same time. Um, another ant or guilt beating ants uh, where you try to motivate behavior with guilt. It's just not effective. Of course, there are things you should and should not do, but motivating behavior with guilt is just not very um, effective. And then there, this is the ant that is causing the epidemic of teenage suicide. It's the less than ants that with social media, teenagers are constantly comparing themselves to false images of other people um, and that drives depression um, and suicide because people just feel hopeless. I can never 
live up to that image. My life is nothing like that. And therefore, I have no hope. So one of the really dark uh, consequences of social media on our young people. Tana, I'm curious from a female perspective, I, I have a daughter that just turned 13, uh, you know, as, as a father, uh, man, I, I want to make sure that, that she has positive thoughts. Uh, what are you seeing from some of the common ants that females struggle with? We got so many women that will be listening to this, watching this. Uh, what, what, what are you seeing? Oh, the less than ant for sure. Um, so we are constantly trying to educate, you know, our daughter and our nieces um, about social media because I hear them constantly. I can't believe like how many women, how many girls my age look like this. And I mean, just the, the constant, you know, they want more, they, they want more perfection. And, and I, I laugh and I'll tell my daughter, honey, supermodels don't look like supermodels. You have to understand that. Th those pictures are doctored, but you can't really get them to understand it. And they feel inferior. And I, I'm so used to telling them that, that over Christmas, this is really interesting. I, I hate the mall. I won't go shop. Like I just don't like going to the mall to shop. So I do all my shopping online and I was shopping and I clicked on something and I see someone who is one of my colleagues and I'm like, how on earth does she look like that? She's my age. Why does she look so good? Why does, and I start going through and I find myself and I know better and I'm trained not to do it. But within five minutes, I was like going down that rabbit hole. And then I pulled myself out and went, what are you doing? Get off of the, get off of the internet. Mm -hmm. And so I did, but we've got to train our youth to be better. And unfortunately they spend so much time being influenced by the internet and by social media and by their apps that it becomes more and more challenging. And I'm really excited about this episode because man, you guys are going to give us a game changing strategy on how to kill these ants. So let's get to it right now. Some of you may need to get a pen, paper. You're going to want to write this down because this is going to help you as well as help those that are around you. So let's jump in and walk us through how to kill these ants. The five questions. So whenever you feel sad or mad, or nervous, or out of control, write down what you're thinking. It's so important because when you write it down, you begin to get it out of your head. You begin to take away its power. And like Earl said, if the front part of your brain works too hard, um, the ant gets on an exercise wheel and picks up steam goes over and over and becomes mad and sad and literally out of control. And all you have to do is write it down. And then there are these five questions we learned from our friend Byron Katie that are just so powerful. And I use them over and over. I'm always in my office going to the board and I'm writing down the negative thoughts. And, and I think the one you had, I actually worked with a patient a couple of weeks ago, is I am worthless mm -hmm. and there's no reason for me to live. And um, oh, by the way, the epidemic of calls to suicide hotlines skyrocketed during the pandemic. So that's part of pandemic square. And we, we have seen that in, in the clinic. Suicidal behavior is just skyrocketing. And that's often the thought that's underlying it. I am worthless and there's no good reason for me to be on earth. Wait and so with this patient, and we can do it with you as well, if you remember back to that time, mm -hmm. it's write it down. There's no good reason for me to live. And then go, is that true? So that's question number one. Is it true? Because killing the ants is not about positive thinking. Both Tan and I are not fans of positive thinking. We're fans of accurate thinking. Positive thinking means I can have these dozen donuts and it's not going to have a negative impact on my level of pain or my um, weight or my health. Um, that's stupid thinking. So we're a fan of accurate thinking. So question number one. So let's go back to that time when you felt um, suicidal, passively suicidal, and go, 
Is that true? Oh, at the time, 100%. Okay. <laughs> Remember, it's just about the truth. Question number two, write this down. Is it absolutely true? With 100% certainty, you should die. Well, I didn't. So um, I couldn't because I knew my mother would be guilt into me into the afterlife. And so I couldn't do it. Um, so, but I'm alive, so it couldn't be absolutely true. Right. But back then, so imagine the 25 year old self. Mm -hmm. And so you would go, yes, absolutely true. I shouldn't be here. No, you'd go, it's true. But is it absolutely true? How would the 25 year old answered that question. I would argue with myself because I would say yes, but it, but then there's somewhere in the back of my mind that obviously was holding on to hope somehow. And you knew it would devastate, devastate your mother. my mother. Right. And you were not heartless enough no. to hurt her. No. Right. Which is one of the reasons why you didn't kill yourself right. or attempt that. Right. The third question is how do you feel when you believe the thought? This is so powerful. Um, so when you believe the thought, you shouldn't be on earth. How does it make you feel? I don't mean to laugh, but. Um, hopeless. Say more. Feel hopeless, um, useless. Powerless. Like there's no reason to live. Worthless. Yeah, worthless. Yeah. So what what question three teaches us, it's the ants that drive negative feelings and often negative behavior. It's our unquestioned thoughts that drive darkness. Fourth question. Love this question. How would you feel and how would you act if you didn't have the thought? If you couldn't have the thought? If I couldn't think I'm not worth, that I'm worthless, if that thought couldn't enter my head, I would be free, hopeful. And then how would you act? Well, I probably would have gotten help. I would have I would have looked for a solution. So when I was stuck with I'm worthless, um, there's no reason for me to be here. Um, you don't look. I wasn't looking for solutions. And are you more likely to get the help you need with the thought or without the thought? Without the thought. Without the thought. So is it true? Can I absolutely know if it's true with a hundred percent certainty? Do I know more than God? How do I feel when I believe the thought? Who would I be without the thought? And then th the last question, my favorite, I love this question, is you take the original thought that is torturing you, I'm worthless, I should die, and you turn it to the exact opposite. And then you ask yourself if that's, True. I mean, it's really mind blowing when you understand this. And so the exact opposite of I'm so worthless. There, there are two that come to my mind. I'm not worthless. Or another way to say it is I'm, I'm, my worth is I have a lot of worth. I have a lot of worth. And I shouldn't die. Right. Um, so let's go back to your 25 year old self. And because your 25 year old self, I've known you for a long time, is a really thoughtful person, is a good person. When she challenges that thought, I have worth and I shouldn't die. And, and you just initially have to find one response to it. Rational, one rational response, because if you find one, you'll find two. Yeah, you can come up and if you find two, good. you'll find four. And so. My mother would be devastated. Uh, my mother loves me. That's one. And how and at the two? time, my faith was 
suffering. Let's just put it that way. So that, that for me was not, I thought God had abandoned me. So I wasn't quite there yet. Um, now it would be a very different outcome. But my mother loves me. My mother loves me. And what about another thought? Why you should love? You know, I'm not sure I was super consciously aware of it, but there was uh, there was sort of a subconscious thought that what what would I miss out on? There there must be something. Life has some sort of purpose. I I knew deep down there was some sort of purpose to life. Why would I just be here for no reason? And so I think that that was nagging at me. I think God was sort of hounding me. I love that. And now, how would you answer that? Oh, well, geez, it would be completely different now. Like what? Um, even if I don't see my, even if I don't see my purpose in the moment, I know God has a purpose for me. I know that if there's one person. That benefits from my past pain then it was worth it. You missed out on me. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have missed out on Chloe. You'd have missed out on me, so. <laughs> or Cat. His nickname is TLC, the last cat. <laughs> so important. These questions, please. So for those I, of you at home, do not believe every thing you say. The, the most important thing for me, and this is the one thing I want to tell people who might be in this place, is... I could not have possibly known that the pain that I was going through then and feeling like God had abandoned me, even though he hadn't, I had abandoned him, but that feeling of like that the world is not worth being in. Um, I could not have predicted that that feeling 26 years ago and that pain that I went through would be literally my purpose at this stage in my life. The thing that drives me. The thing that I've built, you know, my success on, actually. Tana, thank you. Man, just for for being so transparent. I've heard it said if you want to uh, impress people, you can impress people from a distance. But if you want to impact them, get up close and personal. And and if there's anybody out there suffering that they you don't know what this could be for you and mean to other people in the future if you can turn that pain to purpose. I love that. I think you, you take your your mess and they can be used as a message that God used. You, you, your pain becomes your platform. And uh, man, thank you for taking us on that journey. I'm sure there's some of you right now that are experiencing and feeling some of those same things. And just being able to be equipped with these five questions uh, is so helpful. And well, this is all about strategies today around anxiety. So I, I want to go to Dr. Henslin. And uh, Dr. Henslin, uh, I was in your office and uh, I was going through some some ants that I had in, in my own mind. And uh, you introduced me to a strategy and kind of took me on a journey uh, around tapping. Uh, man, share with us more about another strategy to help us with anxiety. Yeah, it's called the emotional freedom technique. And um, what it's based on uh, was the research initially from a Dr. Callahan and then a, and also another uh, man, Earl Craig, where they studied acupuncture and came up with the acupressure points that have to do with emotional issues. And uh, as I studied that technique and that method, I found a way to integrate that spiritually and for Christians. And, and it's also helpful for people who are not Christians as well. Uh, but, it, but it is a method that can kind of quickly you know, change things. Uh, and what's uh, so beautiful about it, you know, when you look at it from a brain standpoint, uh, the tapping process is one of those practical way, ways of lowering that anxiety part of the brain. And whenever that's left and right basal ganglia starts to calm down, then all of a sudden that frontal cortex kicks in better. And, and then you can make those shifts out of the negative thoughts and ants and so on. Otherwise, we just want to really encourage people that if we talk about these strategies, you're not able to do them. There's a high percentage chance that there's a brain chemistry issue. And that's why for the last 25 plus years, I've been enjoying working closely with Dr. Amen. We can take a snapshot of the brain now and we can actually see that. And that makes it real that 
that there is a nutritional, biochemical, hormonal things that can interfere with actually applying a strategy or applying this gospels and so on. But uh, we can take a person uh, through this and I would uh, just kind of quickly and maybe at another time we can go into a little bit more depth. But uh, what, what a person can do is, you know, tap right on the side of your hand and just repeat the words, you know, that I'm going to say right now. And what I'd encourage you to do is think about an issue like, you know, it could be a fortune telling ant, you know, you're worried about the future. Uh, it could be you're stuck with something in the past. Uh, just whatever that issue is, think about, about it right now at this moment, get in touch with the feelings physically and so on, and then say, say this, even though I'm feeling, and then fill in the blank with whatever it is you're feeling right now, I completely accept God's love, his forgiveness of me. Even though I'm feeling, and then fill in the blank, I completely accept God's love, his forgiveness of me. And then tap right here in the inside corner of the eye and just say, God loves me. He's here within me. God loves me. He's here within me. God loves me. He's here within me. And then the outside edge of the eyebrow. Thank you, Lord, that you're right here within me. And at this very same moment, you're right there with my spouse, my children, my grandchildren, my mom, my dad. At this very same moment, you're right there. And underneath the middle eye, and I thank you, Lord, that you love me so much. You died for me. You're here within me. And right now, I'm accepting your love, your forgiveness. In the middle of the upper lip. And right now, Lord, I release fear, worry, hurt, anger. Release, be gone, receive the truth from my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're right here within me, and you love me. And Shen, thank you for your love, your forgiveness, and I release this fear, this hurt, this worry to you. Release, be gone. Receive your love flowing through me. And then right below the collarbone. And I receive your love is flowing through me right from the top of my head. Down through my brain, through my neck, flowing through my spinal column. Flowing through my chest, my heart, my stomach, my legs. All that pain, all that fear, all that remorse now flowing out my feet, disappearing into your love, your kindness, and your care for me. Then right underneath the middle of the underarm, thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your presence. And Lord, I feel your love flowing through me right now. Thank you. And then on the top of the head, thank you in the name of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. well, what are you feeling as you do that? Wow. Amazing. Actually amazing. Yeah. And Earl, when it was developed, people would bring up the trauma that they were feeling. Right. Whatever that might be, fear of public speaking, um, something that happened, an interaction that happened in a store, work, and then they would go through those tapping points. Right. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, go ahead. 
No, I was just, I, I was thinking I've been feeling very, very anxious and frustrated. And my husband calls me the judge. She bought me a gavel. When I watch the news, I get very, very angry. And I, it's, I don't turn the news on. I try not to because it just, it's just bringing up these really awful negative feelings. Right. And so d- doing that technique, it's amazing how just peaceful I feel. Yeah. And the wonderful thing about the technique and, and what we can do is I can, we can put it together uh, a handout, you know, to send so people can actually see the tapping points and everything. But you can go through each point and just say a phrase that's near to you, like, my Lord loves me, my Lord loves me, my Lord loves me. And, and just say that one phrase at each tapping point, and you'll get that effect, you know. And... And that's one of the things I like about the, the, the method is the practical way of calming down that basal ganglia. And then it's like that, that uh, cingulate, that gerbil on a wheel. Then all of a sudden, as, that, as you start to calm and feel God's presence and love, well, then that shifts. And then mm-hmm. you can feel that, whatever that truth is that you're tapping on. And, and we can do this more in future sessions and, and show some other applications, but we'll put together a handout that people can get. All they have to do is go to the Crosspoint website and leave an email or something or register, then we can send this off to people. Yeah, all of these will be uh, will be on a website. If you go to crosspoint.com, you can be able to listen to our episodes, our past episodes as well. And uh, we will we'll put that on there as well. So you can be able to do this with your kids Uh, with your family, maybe you have young children, uh, you know, wherever it is, you can do this, you know, yourself as well. Or if you you need some, uh, you know, support or help and uh, you live in the area, uh, I encourage you to to, to call Dr. Hensland's office and uh, they can be able to help you as well. Uh, Man, this is such a good, uh, man, just episode because we're talking about strategies to anxiety. What are some practical things you can do? We've talked about the the five questions. Uh, We've now done this this tapping exercise. Uh, I wanna bring in the spiritual component now. And if you guys, Dr. Raymond, I, I wanna lead off with you. Talk to us about the power of prayer, meditation, uh, Bible verses, how that works to calm the mind. So, again, you know, I talked about things of remembrance that people can get um, lots of Bible verses for when you're anxious, when you're depressed, when you're in pain, when you experience doubt. And one um, that I really love from John fourteen twenty seven. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And um, both Earl and I have studied uh, prayer and meditation. And what we find is it balances your brain. And calms down the emotional part, the basal ganglia and the amygdala. The amygdala is this fear center in your brain. And I have another term I coined, global amygdala hijacking. So with the (laughs) pandemic and all the fear around it, it's like we've taken the fear center in the brain and hijacked it and exploded it. We can calm it down. And one of the ways to do it is where you bring your attention determines how you feel. So bringing your attention to God's word uh, can be just so helpful during this time. And many Christians actually become afraid of meditation, even though it's mentioned in the Bible 70 times. Um, And meditation is really nothing more than focused attention. And with the focused attention on God's word or on a word, for example, uh, with the relaxation response, well studied from Harvard, people focused on the word one. You could focus on the word Jesus. And it also goes with breath work, learning how to get control over your breathing. So most meditative 
techniques teach you something called diaphragmatic breathing, where you're breathing more lower in your body with your diaphragm, this big bell-shaped muscle between your chest cavity and your abdominal cavity. But basically, this is the rhythm I teach my patients because it triggers the opposite of a fight or flight response. It triggers a relaxation response. And it's three seconds in, so a deep breath, hold it for a second, and then six seconds out. Take twice as long to breathe out as you breathe in. So three seconds in, hold it for a second, six seconds out, hold it for a second, do that 10 times. So less than two minutes and it will relax your nervous system. I love that. Um, this is a little slightly off topic, but it's just to, to sort of add to what you're saying as somebody who's practiced martial arts for a long time. You know, people sometimes wonder they feel awkward because we key eye. You know, it's it's a loud, it's a loud thing, a loud expression that you use. And the word key eye basically means expression of spirit. So it's a way, but we use it because it keeps you breathing. So you're expressing yourself and you're breathing at the same time so that you don't hold your breath because if you hold your breath, you will not win. So um, it's really interesting how powerful deep breathing is. You know, you talk about the word meditation and sometimes Christians may uh, object to that word. Uh, but man, as I go back and look at Joshua 189, it says, study this book of the law that you should meditate in it day and night and, you know, as I heard your definition of understanding of meditation is fixing these thoughts. Uh, if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. I mean, you're, you're thinking the same thing over and over again, but being able to, to fix that back on meditation of God's word. Dr. Henslin, uh, talk to us about, you know, this, this technique, and as we talk about strategies of Bible verses and, and calming the mind and prayer and meditation and, and what that does to the brain. Well, there's an area of the brain, right? If you take your hands and let them fall naturally over the top of your head. It's called the parietal lobes. Mm -hmm. And the parietal lobes process outside sensory experience. And what's wonderful with the brain imaging when per studies that we've done before and after, you can actually see changes in the parietal lobes before prayer and after prayer, which shows that we're actually connecting with God. And when we go into prayer and meditation, you can actually see it on spec scans that it's actually changing the chemistry of the brain. And one of the one of the regions that happens that we've talked about before is it helps calm the basal ganglia. But there's other scans that show it improves the perfusion or the blood flow throughout the frontal cortex. And and that's the executive part of the brain. It has to do with attention, concentration, judgment, impulse control, forethought, and planning. And so that's the part that helps us think through is it's true or not true. It helps us to process that. And so when we go into prayer. And, and particularly uh, get that improved blood flow through. And, and over a period of time, it's actually one of the ways to help heal the brain, you know, because it's almost rare we'd ever scan a man that hasn't bumped. I think everybody bumps their head at some point. Mm -hmm. And usually every scan will show some frontal cortex injury. And you're actually helping to change that and heal that when you spend time in meditation and prayer. Guys, this has been so good today, and I, I want to just encourage you guys, uh, man, all three of, of our guests today have all written some incredible books that will help you with more strategies. We just... We just got to the tip of the surface today as far as what else is out there. Uh, Dr. Henslin's written a great book called This Is Your Brain on Joy. I want to challenge you to pick that up. Uh, Dr. Uh, Amon's written so many books. His latest book is The End of Mental Illness, uh, which will give you a lot of great strategies. And uh, Tana's written The Omni Diet. 
And, you know, she's talked about the importance of food and what that does to anxiety, what that does to your brain and to your health. And, uh, man, I want to say thank you guys so much. People would spend uh, hundreds and thousands of dollars uh, to be able to, to go in, uh, to be able to learn some of these techniques that you guys have given to us as a gift. I mean, the five questions the tapping techniques that we've learned today, uh, the power of breath work, and the, the power of prayer, meditation, and scripture. And so here's what we want to ask you to do today. Uh, we, we've given you so many resources for free today. Now what we want to ask you to do is tell somebody else. Share this on your social media. Uh, take this time today and, and get the word out. Uh, hey, have some conversations with people uh, about what you've learned today and how you can be able to help other people as well. Uh, man, tell your story. You know, Tana got a chance to share her story today. And as they walk through those five questions, uh, I think that there's incredible healing whenever people know that you're real, telling your story. And, you know, I, I just want to let you know that we're here to be able to support you and help you. You don't want to miss the next episode because next time is part three. We're going to be talking about emotional trauma. And every single one of us have experienced emotional trauma in our life. And you need to learn some strategies that will stop the past from infecting the present. You know, you can't change your past, but you can change your future. And so if you want to get unstuck from the past, you don't want to miss the next seminar. Uh, so join us next Wednesday night, uh, 630 live. And uh, we're here at Cross Point Church. Uh, we're here to support you and help you. Uh, if you don't have a church home or you're looking to grow spiritually, uh, man, we would love to be able to help you. We like to say we're, we're hope dealers. Uh, if you lose hope, you lose everything. And, you know, if you some people deal, deal dope, we deal hope. So if you're looking for hope, I want to challenge you. Check us out online at crosspointwithane.com. And we've got some great services and would love to get you and your family involved. We're on a mission to spread hope faster than the coronavirus. Hey, I want to take this time today and just pray for you right now. So let's pray together. God, I love you. And God, I thank you that you have given us strategies and techniques to help with anxiety that we don't have to be riddled, God, with these ants, that, God, you have given us these strategies today, God, that can be able to help us, help our children, help our families, help those that uh, we, we work with, those that we, we work for, those that we lead. And so, God, we thank you that, God, we can be able to come to you, God, with our anxious thoughts. I thank you for Philippians 4, 6, and 7, God, that, that talks to us about the, the power of not being anxious, but God, how you can guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And so, God, we love you. We thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.